Welcome, welcome to our latest public health conversation starter. These uh, starters are a series of conversations we are having with uh, people who we think provide a critical perspective on the work of public health. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by Dr. Seth Berkeley. He is the CEO of Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, a medical epidemiologist by training. He has long been a global advocate for vaccination. In addition to his leadership of Gavi, he is the founder and former president and CEO of the International AIDS Vaccine Initiative. It's really hard to think of anyone better, more qualified, and who's been more engaged in the world of vaccines to talk to about vaccines today. So I'm really delighted to be joined with Dr. Berkeley. Um, um, let's start, Dr. Berkeley, can you, let's start a little bit, just sort of an easy question. Talk a little bit about your background, a little bit about sort of a, your life trajectory, how you ended up at Gavi and what you, you know, what you feel those steps have been that uh, led you to what you do. Thanks, Sandro, and it's great to be with you. And let me just start, um, you know, by by saying that I think public health is very important, but the way I got there was I started out as somebody interested in science, and I ended up working um, with um, uh, uh, people um, um, who were disadvantaged, and that got me interested in, in that aspect of it. I went to medical school, and as part of my medical training, I, I worked overseas and got interested in, in doing that on an international basis, and I shifted from clinical medicine over towards public health. Um, I, I, I went and did the Epidemic Intelligence Service at CDC in the Center for Infectious Disease in, in, in Special Pathogens. And then I used that training um, to, again, get even more interested in infectious diseases. And of course, that brought me to the world of vaccines. And um, I never looked back from that. Um, I spent um, a decade with the Rockefeller Foundation. And there I worked on setting up the predecessor of Gavi and also Gavi. Um, and then I set up IAVI, as you talked about, the International AIDS Vaccine Initiative, but worked closely with Gavi at its beginning. And then um, Gavi got into some trouble. And um, a number of people approached me and said, you know, you're the right guy for the right time. You should go run Gavi. And 12 years ago, I made that decision and joined Gavi and, and um, have uh, not looked back. It's been a fabulous experience. Can you talk a little bit about Gavi, what Gavi is, what it does for those who are new to this? So the, the original idea was there are powerful new vaccines that are being used in wealthy countries. And of course, they would make a dramatic difference in developing countries if they could be made available. So Gavi was created as a public-private partnership to bring together the industrial sector who produces vaccines along with the public health sector, the UN sector, civil society, WHO, UNICEF, the World Bank, um, developing countries to go ahead and put together a deal where we could make these vaccines available. And we started out with um, um, uh, 74 developing countries, but one of the interesting parts of Gavi is that um, the countries pay something. There's no free lunch here. You pay a little bit if you're the poorest countries. As you get wealthier, you pay more until eventually you transition out of Gavi support. So we've had 19 countries that have transitioned out. And, um, and, and as part of that, during that time, of course, we work um, to um, uh, uh, bring all the demand together. And with bringing demand together, we're able to drive prices down and bring new manufacturers into the area so that we are able to, um, we've reduced prices by 98% from what is charged in, in wealthy countries for the 11 vaccines that, that WHO recommends. So it's been a very successful partnership. And we just announced um, we've um, uh, brought, we, we, we provide vaccines for about 50% of the world's children on an annual basis, but we just passed 1 billion unique children immunized, which means um, um, about an eighth of humanity today has had a vaccine from Gavi, and it's led to a 70% reduction in vaccine preventable diseases and um, has contributed to a 50% reduction in under five child mortality. So it's been a very successful partnership. Well, congratulations, those are really, that's really, really cool numbers. Let me shift now, let me, let me go to COVID for a second. We're now in the, in the post, at least the COVID emergency phase. Um, big picture, not just vaccines, big picture. Can you just uh, tell us your assessment of what we did right, what we did wrong during COVID. 
Well, I mean, one of the exciting things about COVID was the fact that um, we were able to create a, um, a vaccine, which is, in a sense, the most important tool for a fast-moving viral pandemic in record time. It took 327 days. There are calls now for trying to reduce that to 100 days. I'm not sure today we could get quite to 100 days, but you know, I think that's exactly the right aspirations going forward. So. The fact that we were able to do that is a really big deal. We did not do as well in, in testing, in um, provision of, of um, you know, other public health measures, PPE, et cetera, around the world. And of course, on the vaccine side, the access um, was quite um, difficult. We, of course, know, we've had experience in previous pandemics that um, there's been vaccine nationalism and, and, and wealthy countries buy up the vaccines for themselves. We expected that in this case. But um, I have to say it was, um, it was really dramatic when it happened, and it really led to some big inequalities, at least in the early days. The good news is because of this new organization, COVAX, that was put together, we were ultimately able to de uh, deliver 2 billion doses of vaccine to 146 countries. And with that, today, we have 55% coverage with primary vaccines in the 92 poorest countries. Um, and that, that, that compares to about 65% coverage globally. So not quite equitable, but, but um, closer than we've ever been before in the world. If you were to take a global view and you were to cherry pick, take from all over the world, what are, what is a bouquet of three, four best practices you saw that different countries did in their response to COVID? That the understanding that countries did different things because of policy and normative constraints, but what were a few key practices that, that were optimal across the world? Well, I mean, from my perspective, the first thing was having really high quality, truthful information available to the population. That's the critical underpinning of where we are. Many countries politicized this, and there were you know, rumors spread by political leaders. I mean, the challenge in a pandemic is you don't have the knowledge on day one. So you have to have trust with your citizens. You got to tell them what you know, and that's going to change over time. And you need to explain it's not that you're misleading. It's just that the knowledge changes as you understand the organism better. So one is that is that knowledge um, 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 and, and trust that exists. A second was in the time when there was not an effective countermeasure was to use the countermeasures that existed, and that was, you know, isolation, that was using masking, um, obviously hand washing, all of those issues, and doing it in a systematic way as much as possible. And as you know, initially it wasn't clear, is this spread person to person? Is it spread, you know, respiratory rise? But as that began to get understood, again, the countries that really did that without controversy were able to move forward. Um, testing was critical, and as you know, the U.S. had a difficult time with testing given the way it was structured. Many other countries did better in terms of having testing available, and that became an important part of the, of the response. And, and, and then, of course, once vaccines were available, having those vaccines made available to the highest risk populations first and making sure that you had a, a tiering of those, of a provision of the product so that you could reach those who would have the biggest, um, you know, a, a effects in the, in the population was absolutely critical. So there's lots of lessons there. For us, the hard part was um, we had over 50 different innovations we had to bring forth to create COVAX. And the challenge in, in, in doing that, the, the, you know, one of the big ones was we didn't have any money at day zero. So we had to go out and fundraise and then bring the money. We donors were very generous. We raised $12.5 billion and were able to purchase these vaccines plus get donations of vaccines. But um, it was slower than it should have been. So in the next time we have to have day zero financing available. And then the other critical issue is, is risk. And that is, um, you know, the ability to take risk. We were able to convince the donors that it was worth taking risk during this time. And, you know, many countries did dramatic things in risk in terms of investing in many vaccines and putting large sums of money there. But, but that's not normally the way the public sector works. And countries that weren't willing to take risk then ended up falling behind.
Let's talk a little bit about uh, vaccine and vaccine information, sort of building a little bit on your last comment. It feels to me like often there are these two conversations going on. There's one which I would call, let's call a bad faith conversation, which is which is people who should know better and they're casting aspersions on the efficacy and safety of vaccines. And as a result, you know, that falls under this bucket of misinformation that we talk about. On the other hand, there's another conversation which I would consider coming largely from actually good faith actors who perhaps in reaction to the bad faith actors are then reluctant to and afraid of acknowledging that vaccines are not perfect and there might be side effects. And I feel like one of the places where that conversation really came to a head, certainly in the US, was around the difficult question of do you vaccinate children that for who are observed with quite low risk for COVID? There may or may not be side effects, et cetera. So I'm just wondering how you how you sort that through in your mind, this the, 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 these polls that we have and 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 where we should end up recognizing these competing forces. Well, that's why having truthful conversations are so important, because we have to say, honestly, vaccines have side effects. All vaccines have side effects. Now, we also have to say that the diseases are bad and, you know, the vaccines pre prevent those side effects of the natural disease in people, because what would happen is they would have, uh, you know, there would be some, um, uh, you know, rare side effect. Um, uh, like we had with um, some uh, blood clots, like we had with some pericarditis. But what we knew was the natural infection caused much more of that than did the vaccine. And of course, at the end, the purpose of the vaccination was to protect you against the severe disease and death that occurred with the disease. So, you know, again, there's truth there, but one has to have the nuance in front of you. And if you're in a situation where people are afraid to talk about nuance because there are these competing forces and people are using this in a politicized way, then it becomes very hard to have those honest conversations. This, by the way, is always a challenge in vaccines because, you know, since the first vaccine smallpox, there have been, um, you know, vaccine hesitancy and concerns and, and some of which quite valid, you know, the vaccines came quickly. Did we test them properly? Do we understand them fully? Those are, those are valid concerns. And what you need, since most people aren't in the extreme of, I will never take these products, or I will take them if they're recommended no matter what, most people are in the middle. And so the challenge is having that conversation with them and, 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 and bringing them along with you. But it's the politicization that made it so hard this time, because normally your healthcare workers or your family members, or your religious leaders or community leaders can help move you along. But in this case, you had author, you know, uh, uh, you know, author, uh, figures of authority that were saying things that were not true, that they knew were not true, and that made it very hard to overcome that. Of course, it was accelerated with social media and the, um, you know, the the misinformation that spread that way. So that was the challenge. I, I very much appreciate both your point about nuance as well as the fact that actually most people are in the middle, which is I think a, a theme to a lot of my writing. The uh, let's talk about misinformation, and you know you've been you've been in this vaccine world now for decades, so uh, you, you obviously are intersecting with this at all times. And it so happens as we're talking, and uh, that right now one of the debates that's happening out in the certainly social media world is whether or not you know vaccine experts should be engaging in debates with people who are actually known to be spreading misinformation. I'm actually curious where you where you land on that. I, I'm I'm torn about it about uh, about the eff the efficacy of those kind of engagements. And I'm actually curious uh, what where your brain has settled on that. So uh, I mean, I've had many conversations with people who had skepticism against vaccines over my career. If they come from a place of real um, you know real concern and are are there to have a real conversation, I think that's a valid thing to do. If somebody is a, a confirmed conspiracy theorist and is using those conversations to kind of drive their conspiracy theory forward, I have less tolerance for that because then what you do is you give more airtime to the conspiracy theories going forward. And I think that is a real debate in terms of what you do. I mean, you know, Sen Senator Patrick Moynihan famously said, you know, you're entitled to your own opinion, but you're not entitled to your own facts. So if somebody comes in with a, you know, an E-Day fix that is completely false and will not and has a long history of not listening to the facts as they exist or to experts that have knowledge based on this, then having a debate on that is not a helpful propos proposition. But as I said, most people are in the middle and therefore it really is about trying to 
help people understand. And there are real answers to those concerns. You know, oh, the vaccines came so quickly, they weren't tested. Well, they had very, very large, you know, trials. Oh, even with those large trials, you know, it wasn't as big in the population. There is post-marketing surveillance that's going on. That, you know, so you can have a rational conversation to help people move forward, but not if you, you know, say inherently these vaccines are bad or, you know, or or um, there's a conspiracy of, you know, in the government or, you know, the black helicopters are coming, et cetera. Um, let me ask you one uh, specific question about um, COVID and vaccination in Africa, where there, were, uh, there was actually quite a bit lower vaccine uptake in Africa. And of course, Africa had much, uh, um, at least as best as we know, uh, lower lower incidence of COVID cases. And I'm just wondering um, um, what your lens on that is in terms of the both the root of the vaccine skepticism there and also coupled with the realities of trying to encourage vaccine <coughs> in a context of lower prevalence in the context of a global pandemic. It was a really complicated set of factors that I think descended upon Africa in particular. I'm just curious about your lens there. Well, first of all, we don't fully understand what the incidence of disease was in most countries because we didn't have good surveillance systems. <coughs> Excuse me, testing was not widely available. So, um, you know, I would I would say that we do think incidence of disease was lower. We didn't see the funeral pyres in most countries, but there was probably more disease pr present than we knew about. Of course, one of the challenges was the age distribution in Africa is very different than in other parts of the world. It's a young continent. You see a lot of young people. And so your at-risk groups were smaller. And often in, in other epidemics, what we saw was, um, you know, really severe disease in the elderly and people with, you know, obesity and chronic diseases, et cetera. And, and again, much smaller populations of that in the, in the South. But to get to your point, um, the challenge was Africa, like everywhere else, um, when the pandemic was spreading, wanted access to vaccines. And because of vaccine nationalism, because of of um, export bans that were going on on some of the primary suppliers, um, we ended up in a situation where there was initial um, vaccines rolling. The first vaccine um, uh, that we provided for COVAX was 39 days after the, the first vaccine in the UK. Nothing like that has ever happened before. And, you know, it moved into the African continent about 65 days after the first one. And, and so we started doing what would be a normal expansive campaign there. And then these export bans shut off the supply and then supply trickled. And as a result, people were quite angry, quite upset. And, um, you know, that led to, um, um, you know, uh, a discontent in the population, an acceleration of rumors and, and other issues um, that really made it a problem. Now, um, you know, one of the challenges, as I said, is we deal with vaccine hesitancy all the time. And the way we deal with it is usually local leadership, religious leaders, community leaders. And in this case, um, because they were not having access. I mean, they were seeing access in the rest of the world, but then they were seeing the politicization and the messages with that. That really made the problem much worse. And we had a situation where when vaccines started flowing, there were a number of countries, some did an incredible job of lifting coverage up. Others have um, low coverage. An example would be as of today, there are um, six countries left in the world with less than 10% coverage. You can imagine some of those are the Hades or the, um, you know, the the Yemens of the world with severe humanitarian situations. But Senegal is on that list, and it's a country that ended up having a lot of of, of concern and 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 um, vaccine hesitancy. Very interesting. I, I didn't realize Senegal was so low. Um, um, as we emerge from the COVID moment, what are your hopes for global immunization? So the, the critical thing that we're trying to do now is 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 continue to make access to existing vaccines that are um, powerful. Um, so, you know, vaccines against pneumonia, diarrhea, against two cancers, um, cervical cancer and, um, and and liver cancer, that's hepatitis B and HPV, but also now new vaccines like malaria vaccines, which you know, are coming. Um, and we, we have down the line some evidence, perhaps that a tuberculosis vaccine might there, be there. Eventually, of course, I hope HIV. So one side is to continue the flow of these powerful prevention 
um, um, you know, um, uh, mechanisms. But the other side is immunization is the most widely distributed of all health interventions. It covers around 90% of families have access to a routine immunization system. That last 10% in the so-called zero dose families, they, that's where 50% of the child mortality is and two thirds of them are below the poverty line. So our challenge is, can we reach those groups? And if we can reach those groups, we put in a health system that's important, not just for vaccines, but for other health interventions and for surveillance for um, outbreaks. Because of course, if you have a, it's your blind spot, if you have no health system and people that are completely outside of the health system, you know, aren't being reached by anybody, as soon as you put that female health worker in those communities and they begin to have interactions, then you um, can also detect outbreaks in addition to providing the supplies. Last question. Uh, what advice do you have for uh, young people who are interested in making a true difference in the health of populations, in particular sort of in the world of vaccines? Well, I, I mean, I think, you know, um, obviously I'm enthusiastic for vaccines. For every dollar we spend on vaccines, we have a $54 benefit. It's, it's you know, the most um, powerful tools we have in, in, in public health. And um, there's a lot of work that can be done because the science is breathtaking at the moment. We're about to enter, I believe, two things. One, an era of polyepidemics. Why? With, with climate change and displacement of people, increased populations, desertification, all of these are going to lead to things that are going to accelerate um, um, you know, epidemics. And so on one side, you have a, a world that's more dangerous. On the other side, during COVID, we had over 200 different vaccines under development and, and a lot of the science is moving forward and we have new technologies and, 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 and new ways of producing vaccines. And so I suspect we're gonna have a whole new set of vaccines. A couple that we're excited about right now that are just coming out are vaccines against neonatal diseases. So RSV um, and, and group B strep are two, you know, that, that killed in the, in the neonatal period and we don't, the mortality rates haven't gone that, that much down in neonatal as opposed to the under five. So that's an example of where we can make a difference. So I think this is an area of, of growth. Um, prevention from my perspective is almost always better than, than, uh, you know, than, than treatment. And so, um, you know, in a world where health costs are going up, where, you know, disease patterns are more and more in the, in the very young and in the very old because of the aging of the population, having preventive strategies in way will be really important to trying to improve the health of the population. And therefore, there's great opportunity to work in this space. Seth, uh, thank you for everything you, you're doing. Thank you for everything you did during COVID. And uh, thank you for talking to us. Really, it's a pleasure reconnecting. Thank you. It's nice to see you again. And, and um, thank you for doing this for the students. Take care, Seth.